All right, well, it looks like we're all set. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Camilla Dos Santos, and I'm the program coordinator of the Healthy Relationships Initiative, which I'll tell you about in just a little bit. Um, in today's program, we're going to talk a lot about burnout. I know in today's uh, really hectic and uncertain world, we are all really dealing with different levels of stress. Um, and it's important to really know when those levels of stress turn into burnout. And we're gonna talk about those differences and what that looks like. Um, but I'd like to get started by thanking our partners, Healthy UNCG and Stephanie Milroy. Um, we always love to partner with uh, organizations on campus and especially Healthy UNCG, which promotes a lot of employee wellness. So um, I'm glad to be here today. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time today telling you about the Healthy Relationships Initiative. We're a partnership between UNC Greensboro and the Phillips Foundation, and our mission is to promote happy, healthy, and safe relationships of all kinds. And we do that in a number of ways, but primarily we host and co-host events throughout the community. Um, our resources include things like webinars and articles, different videos and blogs, as well as professional trainings for those who work in mental health services, education, and beyond. Um, I encourage you to connect with us on our website, healthyrelationshipsinitiative.org, as well as on our social media, at Healthy Relationships Initiative, on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we have a lot of daily tips and relationship advice for relationships of all kinds. So check us out. Um, so today we're, we're, we're talking a lot about burnout, but we're going to dive into a little uh, different aspects of it. So we're going to talk, we're going to learn how to recognize uh, burnout. So we'll talk about the signs and we'll define that word for you today. Um, we're going to get into some of the risk factors and causes. And then really the bulk of the program today is going to be focused around overcoming and preventing burnout. Um, because the reality is many Americans right now are reporting burnout. In fact, I saw a lot of different articles that uh, basically reported Americans, 60% uh, and over of Americans in, in the United States right now are feeling burnout in some way. So a lot of those studies read 60% uh, or higher figures. So we're feeling it. Um, and so we're gonna talk about some strategies to overcome it, but then prevent it. You will all leave here today with a free resource, a burnout action plan. Um, I will walk you through how to, how to complete that. And then your follow-up activity on your own will be to complete that burnout action plan and um, sort of revisit it over these next few weeks. We'll have some time for questions and then we'll close this out. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, a couple of things before we start. Please feel free to ask any questions in the chat room. I do have um, my director of the, uh, my director, Christine Murray of the Healthy Relationships Initiative on here today, and she'll be fielding some questions as well as Steph, Steph Milroy. So feel free to kind of ask as they come up. So the first section of today's program really has to do with recognizing burnout. Um, the reality is, is if we don't know the signs or what we're looking for, it's gonna be really difficult for us to know when we're in that situation. Um, and so it's gonna be hard for us to get out of it, right? So when we talk about recognizing burnout, um, the first thing I really wanna do with, with you here today is define that word for you. Because burnout uh, can be, I think, misconstrued depending on how that word is used. Um, but truly, the definition of burnout has to do with chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. So there's two parts to that definition that I really wanna highlight today. The first part is the chronic workplace stress part. Um, we're seeing a couple of key words there. The first key word is workplace. So when we're referring to any kind of burnout feelings, we are talking in the context of our professional environments. Now, that doesn't mean that burnout doesn't seep into other aspects of our lives. We certainly know that when we are burned out at work, we have um, a number of other aspects of our lives that are impacted, and we'll talk about that. Um, but in general, when we're referring to burnout, we're talking about workplace stress. We're talking about chronic workplace stress. So not uh, one or two stressful days back to back, but a, a, a pattern of stressful, high stress, high ten, uh, tension days um, that sort of happen more often than not. And then that second piece has to do with uh, not successfully managing that stress. And so all of us experience stress every single day. Um, and we have different levels of being able to cope with that stress depending on what's going on in our lives. But when we experience burnout, it's not just that we're experiencing stress. It's that we are experiencing stress and we're not managing it. 
Um, so those are the, the really big pieces of burnout and those components do have to be present in order for you to uh, actually be identified as experiencing burnout. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't symptoms that can look like burnout. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. Let's dive in a little bit more. Um, there's three different dimensions to this idea of burnout. And this first, uh, and so when we talk about dimensions, we're talking about what people see or what you experience and feel. And so that first uh, idea is that people who are burned out feel exhausted. They feel as if they don't have energy. Um, and that can feel very different from high stress because a lot of times when we're really stressed, we might have energy. Um, so when we're, we're talking about burnout here, people who are burned out have very low energy, feel very exhausted, even if they're getting sleep, even if they're you know, kind of focusing on some of those physical aspects, they feel tired and fatigued every day. And then a second piece of the uh, sort of burnout definition is this idea that people who are burned out start to distance themselves from their work. That distance can be a mental distance or an emotional distance, um, not necessarily connecting with your work, um, not feeling super inclined to uh, do your best, um, but it can also be a, a physical distance, you know, missing meetings, not uh, showing up to work on time, taking a lot of sick days. Um, and then to add to that sort of mental distance, there's this emotional component where you feel very negative and cynical about your job. Um, and so whenever situations at work arise or whenever an issue arises, you immediately kind of go to this negative place. You know, I hate my job. I, um, this always happens. Uh, those kinds of really extreme negative thoughts that may or may not be accurate. And then the third part of uh, this idea of burnout is that because of what we're experiencing in one and two, because we don't have energy, because we're sort of distancing ourselves from work, our productivity is affected, right? So this third piece of burnout is that when you experience burnout, your workload, your work productivity, all of these things start to decrease and you start to produce less quality materials in your work. So let's talk about those signs. Um, it, it is really hard for us to know that we're burned out if we don't know what that looks like. So let's dive into the emotional piece here. Um, when we're burned out, there's a lot of emotional baggage that sort of comes along with that. We feel a sense of failure, self-doubt, um, and that's not always, a, a, that, that could be your perspective, but it's not always reality. So a lot of times when people are burned out, even if they're doing well at work or achieving their metrics, they still feel like they're failing. They'll, they still feel like they're not doing well. Um, so it doesn't necessarily actually have to look like that in real life. It doesn't have to be the reality. It could just be somebody's perspective that they're failing. Um, there's these feelings of helplessness, feeling trapped, feeling defeated, um, feeling alone. Burned out people could uh, work in a huge corporation with many people in the office and have plenty of teams to kind of talk to and, and work with, but they still feel alone. They still feel like they're not connected at work. Again, whether it's reality or their perception um, really is irrelevant, right? Because it's what they're experiencing. There's a loss of motivation. Um, you don't feel like doing the things that you want to do anymore, right? Whether they're work-related or not. Um, you're increasingly cynical and negative, uh, whether the situation calls for it or not. So you just um, view your work and the things that you do related to work as uh, not a positive thing anymore. Um, there's decreased satisfaction and just senses of accomplishment. So even if you're uh, doing what you need to do at work, you feel like you're not. So these are some of the emotional signs. And um, I do encourage people to, to uh, put in the chat room if there are some signs that I don't mention here. Moving on to some of the physical things that we feel and that maybe others in our lives see. Um, people who are burned out, they often feel tired and drained, even if they get enough sleep. Um, their immunity is lowered, so they have uh, more frequent colds, more frequent um, just issues, you know, sinus infections and uh, staying home for different reasons, migraines, things like that. Um, frequent headaches or body aches, so that can be muscle pain, that can be sort of maybe your neck feels tight. Um, and then there's changes in appetite or sleep, whether you are sleeping and eating too much or not enough. Um, and then also just experiences of, you know, losing, not having an appetite. So um, knowing you need to eat, but not really having the stomach for it. 
And so let's talk about some of the behavioral signs. Um, and I have to laugh at a comment in the chat room that this slide sounds exactly like the year 2020. I would agree. I think, I think the year 2020 should be the burnout year, right? Um, so let's talk about these behavioral things. So this is what other people see us doing. Um, they see burned out people withdrawing from their responsibilities. Um, maybe not attending that meeting, maybe not being as active in certain aspects of work uh, like they used to be. Um, isolating yourself from others, whether it's isolating yourself from your work crew or your family and your friends. Um, people who are burned out might, you know, ignore a couple calls more often than they would, might not be uh, attending those Zoom get-togethers as often. Um, they tend to, to withdraw themselves. And then other things are just procrastinating knowing you need to get something done and, and having a hard time you know, getting there. Um, using any kind of substance, so food, drugs, or alcohol to cope um, or to not cope, to not feel. Um, taking out your frustration on others, lack of patience, skipping work, arriving late, leaving early. Um, so these are, these are some really clear signs in the behavioral section. Um, so as you kind of look at these different categories, it's safe to say that that first category with emotional signs, um, that's not as easy to pinpoint, right? That's not something that others can see in us right away. And that's not something that if you're um, constantly, if you're not constantly evaluating where you stand and how your emotions are, you might not catch yourself until you are, you're experiencing those things. Um, so it's really important to not only recognize the signs of burnout, but to know what they look like in you specifically. Um, so for example, you know, you might be somebody who when you feel burned out, you know that um, you start to lose sleep or your sleep is impacted. So that's a red flag for you. Um, and so when you look at this list, you really want to think about what does this look like for me? Um, what, do, what happens specifically to me when I experience these things? Now, I mentioned earlier that whether or not you're burned out, we're all feeling high stress. But I think it's important to tell the difference between stress and burnout. Um, that's not to say that the strategies that sort of help to decrease burnout won't also help to decrease stress. But they're very different emotions and they come from sort of, and they, they look different in how, they, um, in how we, we show them. So when we're talking about stress, that is characterized by being overly engaged, whereas burnout, we're talking about disengagement. So people who are really stressed um, can sometimes actually appear more manic and kind of high energy, whereas people who are burned out have that fatigue. Um, again, these are going to be more generalizations because stress looks different for everyone, but in general, people who are stressed are over-engaged. They're, um, they're doing too much, whereas people who are burned out they could still be doing too much, but it's causing them to disconnect. Um, people who are stressed feel emotions sort of on overload. Um, you feel them very strongly and very intensely and in sort of waves. People who are burned out um, have sort of less intense feelings that sort of stay around. You know, they don't, it, uh, they, they're, they kind of stick with you. So you're always sort of fatigued. You're always sort of frustrated, right? Um, and while you might come out of it every now and then, it's characterized by feeling that way for a long period of time. Um, people who are stressed tend to sort of be uh, more hyperactive, as I mentioned, have this sense of ur urgency, where people who are burned out feel more helpless and more hopeless. Um, you know, people who are burned out, there's more around sort of motivation and feeling uh, sort of like you, uh, what you embarked on in your job is maybe not what it ended up being, right? So we see a lot of ideals being sort of crushed. Um, whereas people who are stressed, uh, they're experiencing sort of maybe loss of energy in a particular phase in their lives. Um, and they also might identify a little bit more with anxiety, whereas people who are burned out might identify a little bit more with depression. Um, again, not to say that these things can't mix, but this should really help you kind of get a sense of, are you stressed out or are you burned out? And so now let's kind of answer that question individually. Um, I'd like for everybody to either take a piece of paper or post it or open up something on their computer and um, label your, your, your lines from one through 10 and spend some time answering these questions. They're yes or no questions. We're not going to go ahead and share um, your, what, what your results were. But the idea here is I want you to get a sense of where you are today. 
And so let's take some time, answer these questions one through 10 on your piece of paper, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that once I've given you a chance to answer these. Right. And so if you had a chance to answer those questions, here's a little bit of a guide for you. Um, if you have answered yes to any of these questions, you are at risk for burnout, not necessarily burned out. If you answered yes to more than half of these questions, you are likely burned out. Um, and so that gives you a little bit of a sense here. Basically, what I will say is if you've said yes to any of these questions on the slide, um, you'll want to pay some close attention to the next part of this program because it's likely that you need some support. Um, and in today's world, I think that we can all probably answer yes or maybe at some points given everything that's going on um, in today's society. So let's move on to the nitty gritty here. Let's talk about how we overcome burnout um, because many of us can be in it right now. So if you're in it right now, um, talking about how to prevent it is probably not where you need to be right now. We need to talk about how you get out of it first. So when we talk about overcoming burnout, your, your first step is going to be to understand the potential causes. You know what it looks like, but let's talk about why it happens, why some people are more prone to burnout than others. And so the first thing here is, is gonna be a lack of control whatever that looks like in your role. So whether that means that you feel that you don't have an ability to influence decisions, maybe you feel like um, you don't have any say on your schedule or there isn't much flexibility, or maybe you think that you don't uh, have too much say on your workload or you don't, under, you don't know the expectations of your role. Anytime that we feel that we don't have control or some autonomy over our, our job, um, that can potentially lead to burnout because it's sort of like always living in the unknown, always being uncertain about what to expect next. The second piece to this is um, people who have unclear job expectations are likely to experience burnout. Um, so whether that means uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not sure um, if you're achieving to what your supervisor's expectations are, or maybe you don't have a very clear sense of how to uh, move through a certain process. But anytime you're uncertain and you're not super sure about where you stand in your job, that can potentially cause burnout. Additionally, anytime we're dealing with dysfunctional workplace dynamics, whatever that looks like. So if you are dealing with um, an office that uh, is heavy with gossip, or maybe you're dealing with leadership that might not always be transparent. Um, or maybe you see unfairness in how people are treated. Um, maybe you're, you're experiencing or you're witnessing bullying and harassment. If any of those things are present in the workplace, it's going to be really hard to avoid burnout um, long term. Additionally, extremes of activity are also uh, potential causes of burnout. So whether your job is very monotonous and you do the same thing every day, or whether your job is super chaotic and every day is different, whenever you sort of live in these extremes, um, it can really lead to fatigue and job burnout. Uh, so it doesn't have to be super crazy. Uh, it could be one end of the spectrum or the other. Anytime we're talking about extremes, it can be hard to cope. And finally, a lack of uh, social support. So like anything in life, when we feel isolated, we feel stressed because we don't have people to talk to or to share our burdens with. And at work, it's no different. So if you feel isolated at work, you're likely to feel more stress um, and you're likely to experience burnout because you don't have the support to overcome tough times. And then this is a big one in today's society, especially in the U.S. Um, Work-life imbalance is, a, is one of the I think one of the more 
obvious potential causes of burnout. Um, and we heard it mentioned in the, in the video a little bit er uh, earlier today. But basically, if your work takes up so much of your time and effort that you don't have the energy to do things for yourself, spend time with your family, um, you're eventually going to burn out. And further, if you identify so strongly with your job that when things go wrong, it's a hit on your identity, um, that can be an imbalance as well because your identity is imbalanced in the sense that you really view yourself based on what you do, um, which is very common in today's society. How often do we start a conversation with someone we don't know and you know, we say, what do you do? Um, and so we do identify ourselves really by, by our work, but that can lead to some problems and probably is why many Americans are burned out. So a second uh, concept to overcoming burnout is this idea of just doing something, taking any small action. So if you answered yes to any of the questions on the previous slide, I encourage you to take one small action today. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that means. Um, the first really has to do with evaluating your options, right? Um, and I remember I, I did a, a burnout program not too long ago for college students. And so we were talking a little bit about you know, what happens when you have to evaluate your options and you know, several college students in the room raised their hand and said, well, sometimes you have to quit your job. Well, sure, sometimes, you know, you do have to consider other employment. But in today's world and with the pandemic and everything going on, um, many of us are not inclined to uh, leave our jobs if we've got a job right now. And so when we talk about evaluate options, we've got to think about more than that, right? So we want to think about um, being transparent, discussing any concerns with your supervisor or your leaders, um, working together with your team or your company to fix some of those problems that maybe you've identified. So if there's communication issues across teams, is there something that can be done better there? Um, is there something that you can do to directly sort of impact what's going on in your workplace? Seeking support, that's always a useful strategy whenever we're going through anything in life. Um, but in this context, I'm really talking about support in the workplace. So reaching out to your coworkers, um, reaching out to different resources that your company might provide, um, trying to collaborate with somebody different just to sort of develop a different relationship at work. Um, basically, seeking support is a really good strategy, but I also challenge you to maybe seek support from uh, sources that are uh, that you might not always seek support from. Trying a relaxing activity is really always a good idea when you're stressed, but in general, doing it intentionally when you're burned out is a really good first step or a really good small action to take. So whatever that looks like for you. Um, I've got a friend who she likes to sit in the room with the lights off and the sound off and she just likes to deep breathe. That's her relaxing activity. Um, some people like to do yoga. Some people like to go for walks. Um, but being intentional about doing something for yourself to help you unwind is a really good first step to take to get you down the road to overcoming burnout. I've uh, lumped these two together because I think it really just has to do with taking care of your physical self too. Um, and sometimes people forget about the basics. So getting enough exercise and getting enough sleep are really crucial parts of overcoming burnout. And sometimes we take them for granted. Um, so, you know, getting however many hours of sleep that you need, um, if you can squeeze in a nap every now and then, making sure you're moving your body and breaking a sweat in some way each day. These are things that seem really simple, but they go a long way in helping us sort of kick burnout to the curb. And then uh, there's this whole concept of mindfulness, and I could probably sit here today and talk, for you, uh, talk with you for an hour on the concept itself. Um, but in general, when we're talking about mindfulness, we're really just talking about being where your feet are, right? So if you're having lunch with your spouse, be there having lunch with your spouse. If you are working on an assignment for work, put all of your attention on that. Um, another way that mindfulness, mindfulness really looks like in today's pandemic world is, you know, if you're on that Zoom call or you're on that video meeting call with your team, be there, right? Don't check your email. Um, don't peruse your phone while you're on a video chat. Um, in general, we really underestimate in our society the benefit of just doing one thing at a time. Um, and of course, we're all very busy and we want to multitask. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's okay to just sit there and eat your lunch. It's okay to just sit there and uh, chat with a coworker on Zoom, even though you've got some other things to do. Um, so just really being in the moment. 
and then um, insert fun into the mix. I think when things get tough and things get chaotic, the first thing we say we don't have time for is fun, when actually that's probably one of the first things we should be making time for. So whatever that looks like, fun by yourself, fun with your family, doesn't need to be a whole day of fun. It could just be 30 minutes of doing something silly, um, just getting yourself smiling, getting those endorphins going. And uh, another thing to kind of think about too is, you know, there's something to be said for faking it until you make it. So even if you don't want to have fun in that moment, do it anyway. Um, how many of us have sort of forced the smile, you know, to kind of keep it going? And then before you know it, you feel a little bit better. So again, um, fun's not going to fix everything, but it's a great small action to kind of shock you out of that burnout. Another big piece about overcoming burnout is making intentional connections. You've heard me say that people who are burned out withdraw. They tend to disconnect from work. So it makes sense that to overcome burnout, you have to fight against that, right? You have to try to make those intentional connections. And so I've listed a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, whether you reach out to someone in your personal life and connect and just have a conversation that has nothing to do with work. Um, or whether that means that maybe you become a little bit more open to connecting with your coworkers outside of the work environment. So, you know, if your company or your team does, uh, you know, uh, happy hour Zooms or weekend exercise classes, take advantage of those. Sometimes when we have fun with our coworkers and we don't talk work at all, um, we end up sort of rejuvenating ourselves and being more productive, even if that, you know, that's not our intention. A big part too of sort of overcoming burnout is if you're surrounded by negative people um, and you're constantly sort of hearing these negative messages, especially around work, um, you know, we've all heard misery loves its company. So if you're sort of hanging around the group at work that likes to complain and be cynical, be honest with yourself about that and maybe consider limiting your contact. You know, I think that sometimes we um, take for granted the messaging that is around us um, and we don't understand often how it subconsciously really impacts how we live and how we view li our lives. So, you know, if you find yourself kind of um, talking a little bit more negatively about things and uh, gravitating towards people that like to do the same, you might want to um, just limit your contact or consider seeking out other friendships. Um, and then, you know, another thing that people often do is maybe you might not want to connect with a person or you might not want to develop a new friendship, but you might want to connect with a cause. You might want to do something um, to volunteer. I know that early on in my school counseling career, I felt a lot of burnout. Um, and so one of the things that I, I started doing was volunteering with dogs and uh, going to shelters and just kind of getting involved in something that wasn't related to my work. And that really was uh, helpful to me. And so thinking about what that is for you, what are you passionate about? What do you enjoy doing? Um, and maybe if it's not a cause, maybe it's just a project that you do on your own. Finding new friends is always a, a good strategy and it doesn't have to be a work friend and it also doesn't have to be someone you talk to every day, but maybe you join a book club or maybe you just uh, have a friend that you talk to about certain things or a friend that you call when you know you wanna laugh. Um, but really connecting with some new people could be a good idea to overcome burnout. And then of course, there is professional help out there to, um, there's people out there who can help you overcome burnout. And so whether you would like to do that proactively because you just want somebody to kind of help you um, overcome those initial steps, or whether you are deep in burnout and you really need somebody to help you see yourself out of it. Um, there's a lot of different professional resources out there and a lot of people who are trained to help you cope. And so now let's get into sort of um, the proactive piece of today's program. And so the idea is that you have the tools to overcome your burnout if you're in it now, right? We're gonna take small actions. We're going to make intentional connections. We're going to, um, we're gonna do what we need to do to get ourselves out of the funk, right? But then how do we prevent ourselves from feeling burnt out again in the future? Um, we all know this pandemic is, it's lasted longer than any of us have ever imagined, and it's probably going to be with us for some time. And so it's safe to say that we're all kind of um, walking a fine line here with burnout, and we need to be very aware, um, and it's also useful for us to know how to prevent it. So let's talk about how to do that. Um, number one thing you can do to learn how to prevent something is know what can cause it or what are some of the risk factors for causing it right so you might 
it, it might be helpful to you to know what kinds of uh, risk factors are present in people who tend to experience burnout. And so what we often see is we see, and I've mentioned this before, um, people are more likely to be burned out if they identify so strongly with work that they are lacking other parts of their personal life. And so you heard in the video um, that she mentioned that a lot of people who are burned out aren't married and don't have kids. And so that is probably a little bit different than our ideas of burnout because you think of burnout as you know people with kids and parenting and remote learning and of course they're burned out too um, but so are those that don't have those responsibilities and so that really has to do with how strongly are you identifying with work and what else do you have going on in your life to kind of offset that um, another risk factor is when you have a high workload, including overtime work, and a lot of people are experiencing that right now too, especially essential workers and medical professionals, um, teachers, people are working overtime and they've got a lot on their plate. And so um, that's going to be a risk factor for sure. This is a big one. And I think if you're, if you are this person and you're reading this bullet, you are sort of checking yourself right now, right? So people who try to be everything to everyone tend to be more burned out. Um, and so, you know, that, that looks really different depending on who you are as an individual. Um, but consider things like, you know, do I need to say no every now and then? Can I realistically take this on? Is there somebody else who can be a better fit for this project? Or is there somebody else who would do this better than me? Um, it's okay to say no, it's okay to delegate. Um, but people who don't do that tend to really feel burned out. And so this uh, is interesting because I think, you know, when we talk about helping professions, we always go to the healthcare workers, the counselors, the therapists. But what's really important to consider is that, especially in a pandemic, a lot of physicians have turned into helping professions, whether or not that was always the intention. So, you know, when I think about helping professions right now, I'm thinking folks who are helping people navigate different services, people who are speaking with people on the phone to help them, you know, figure out their benefits or figure out um, what, what resources they have during this time. And so helping profession is much more right now than people who are, um, in healthcare or in education. So that's a, that's a lot more people than we could originally, we would originally think. And so if you find yourself identifying with any of these, I see somebody mentioned in the chat room, working for a university absolutely is a helping profession. You're interfacing with people directly, students, faculty, you're supporting them, you're answering questions. Um, and a lot of times you might not always know. And so you're having to do a lot of research right now because we're in such an unprecedented time. And so helping professions during a pandemic, um, I would say a lot more jobs would, would sort of be categorized under that. So there's a lot more people at, at risk for burnout right now. And I've, you've heard me say this uh, before, but in general, when we don't feel like we have any control over our work, that's going to be a risk factor for burnout. Um, so, and, and that can look very different as I've mentioned earlier. And then this last one, if your job is monotonous, that can be a risk factor as well as we've talked about if it's super high energy as well. And so once we know what those risk factors are, we really want to build resilience in ourselves. And so when we talk about building resilience, we're talking about incorporating stress management and emotional balance strategies that work for you. So what I mean by that is, you know, we often hear, for example, do yoga to overcome stress. And absolutely, there's plenty of science and studies that show that, you know, people who do yoga really can uh, deal with their stress. However, maybe yoga is not for you, or maybe um, it's just not something that you enjoy doing. And so rather than find, or rather than just trying out a bunch of different things, I really want you to, I really want to encourage you to, to be intentional about what works for you. And don't worry about if it's the best practice or don't worry about if everybody's doing it. Um, if you enjoy going for walks and that's what helps you stay balanced, don't change that, right? So it's a, it, what we're looking for here is a really individualized approach. And so we're also going to, in, in terms of building resilience, you're gonna to wanna to focus on your self-care. And when we talk about self-care, I really like to just simplify it in the sense that it's anything that you do on purpose to take care of yourself. So if you're doing it intentionally, deliberately, to take care of either your mental, emotional, or physical health, that's self-care. 
Um, and so it doesn't have to be super lengthy. It doesn't have to be a, a big thing. It could be very small. Every day I'm going to take five minutes to myself and I'm going to uh, sit in silence, whatever that looks like. Um, but it's gotta be deliberate and it's gotta be for you. And so let's talk about those golden rules of self-care uh, because I think when we can kind of just think about self-care as a very simplified thing, we're more likely to do it. So when we talk about self-care, we're talking about the basics here. Um, are you eating? Are you drinking water? Are you exercising? And exercising is anything you do to move your body. Are you uh, spending time outside? Are you interacting with your family? Um, these basics are the first thing that we knock to the curb when life gets hard. Um, if you think about it, how many of you early on, the early on in the pandemic maybe weren't eating as regularly as you should, or maybe weren't drinking enough water as you should? How many of you had um, your sleep impacted early on in the pandemic, right? So those basics are the first thing that we lose sight of when we're stressed. So in order to sort of overcome that and prevent that burnout long-term, we're gonna wanna stay really in tune to our basics and make sure that we're doing them. And then of course, like anything in life, if you don't plan for it, it's not gonna happen. So when you're talking about your own self-care, you should frame it in your head, not as, you know, when I have 10 minutes today, I'll go take a walk, but rather I'm going to make 10 minutes today for my walk. And so whatever that looks like for you, if you need to put it in your calendar, if you need to put an alert on your phone, if you need to set up an accountability partner so that somebody's reminding you, hey, you need to go for a walk, um, plan for it and make sure that you don't let obstacles get in your way. And then of course, like anything in life, we want to check in and make sure it's working. So if your strategy is to, um, to go for a walk, I'm gonna use that because that is my strategy. Um, but sometimes it doesn't always work for me or sometimes I need to go for a longer walk. Sometimes that walk needs to be without my devices. Sometimes that walk needs to be you know, with my headphones and music. So just checking with yourself and adapting accordingly. Um, what works one day might not work the next day. And the best thing you can kind of do is stay in tune and ask yourself, is this working for me? Do I need to do something else? And then another big piece of preventing burnout has to do with knowing your signs. So you heard me talk about signs, you heard me sort of talk about what burnout looks like in most people, but that's not super helpful if you don't really know what burnout looks like in you. So what are your signs? Um, and remember that not all signs of burnout are created equal. Right? So for example, um, if one week I'm struggling at work and maybe my initial signs of burnout that I'm feeling are uh, a lack of patience and maybe I'm struggling to sleep, um, I could probably get a handle on that a lot faster than if I was experiencing hopelessness and disillusionment with my job. So when we talk about signs of burnout, they're all serious and they're all things we need to be aware of, but they're definitely not all created equal in the sense of overcoming them and preventing them. And so what you wanna think about is um, connecting strategies for different signs in yourself. So for example, you know, if you start to see some of the physical signs of burnout in yourself, lack of sleep, changes in appetite, um, body aches, you might want a set of strategies for that, uh, for those signs. Whereas if you're experiencing some of the emotional signs of burnout, those strategies might be different. And so just knowing what those are, knowing they're not created equal, and then also really diving into yourself. What does it look like for you? And another big piece, like anything in life, is you know when we constantly reevaluate our priorities and are in touch with why we do what we do, we're more likely to not lose sight of the positives of, of what we have and, and why we wake up in the morning and go to work. Um, and so a big part of that is rediscover your why. I think when times are hard and a pandemic and all the chaos that we've been going through and the tension in our relationships, you can sometimes forget what, uh, why you took that job or why you embarked on that career or why you went to school for, for a certain thing. Um, and so tap into that, you know, what is your why? What gets you up in the morning? Um, what keeps you going when life is tough? And for some of you, that might be your children and your family. Um, for some of us, that might be uh, leaving a legacy behind for our family or feeling like we're making a difference in the community or all of those things. We don't have to just have one why. Um, but spending some time just writing why I do what I do. What keeps me going when life is tough is really gonna help us keep our priorities in check 
um, and help us not lose sight of, of what's going well. And then like anything in life, uh, when we're not setting boundaries, we're not making the most of our time. And I think a lot of times people think of boundaries as a negative connotation, right? I'm gonna set boundaries around this and I'm gonna say no. Um, but it, it's really more than that. Boundaries are there to help us make the most out of our time so that we can be our best selves. And so when you think about it in that context, it becomes really a little bit easier to set those boundaries. So think about what that looks like for you. Um, do you need to set boundaries around overextending yourself at work? Do you need to set boundaries around relationships at work? Um, do you need to set boundaries around the logistics when you start and end your day? Um, how often you take a break? So these are different things that you need to sort of think about in terms of your boundaries. And then of course, when we're, when we're thinking about boundaries, we want to also communicate them to the people around us so they know why, right? So if your boundary is that, um, maybe you're going to refrain from taking on additional projects at work until you finish what you've got, you know, right now. And once that's cleared with your boss and that's your plan, it might be a useful strategy to tell your team, um, you know, for the rest of this quarter, I'm focusing on these uh, strategies right here. And so that way everybody just kind of knows what's going on and it's transparent. And then a big one, especially when we're all at home and it seems like everything we do is online, um, you're gonna wanna disconnect each day. And so whatever that looks like, I know it's not realistic for everybody to disconnect for an hour, um, but it probably can be realistic for you to disconnect for five minutes. And so um, really taking the time to be away from a screen and to interface with somebody in your home or with a loved one, um, that's gonna be really helpful to just kind of preventing burnout. So, taking opportunities to disconnect and to bond. So that leads us to the uh, final piece of the program here where we're going to dive into an action plan. So if you've got any questions for me right now, feel free to kind of ask them in the chat room um, or if you're with us on Facebook Live, please feel free to make a comment. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and, and kind of get you started on this action plan. And so the first thing I'd like to do is give you a link to that. Um, so those of you who are with us in Zoom, you'll be getting that link in the chat room now. And if uh, Dr. Murray can send that link in the Facebook chat room, that would be great as well. Um, but so everybody go ahead and click on that link if you can. If you can't, we're going to follow along together here. Um, but this is the follow up activity I mentioned earlier. And so after today's program, when you have some time, I'd really like to encourage you to dive into your own burnout. Um, you've heard me say that your burnout looks different from somebody else's. And so your most, your most powerful tool is getting familiar with your own burnout and what, the, and what it looks like. And so the first page is really going to be about identifying what your burnout looks like. And um, I've got some examples, but really what I'd like for you to do is, is dig deep and think about um, what does burnout look like for me? And you're gonna write those in those boxes. And of course, you know, um, this is for your uh, individual work. So however you wanna take those notes is, is up to you. Um, and then you're also gonna dive into what causes my burnout. So what does it look like and what causes it? And so these are some of the things that we were talking about earlier, like, um, you know, the example I put on there was that changes in my job can make it difficult for me to know what to expect. And so that uncertainty can be a cause of my burnout. That's one example that you can sort of, uh, that can sort of help you as you think through this. Once you complete that first page and you really kind of thought intentionally about what burnout looks like for you, what typically causes your burnout, then we're gonna dive into the second page, which has to do with overcoming your burnout. Um, and this is where you'll answer some questions around, you know, how does stress impact your relationships, your work productivity? Um, and then you're gonna get into the practical piece where you'll write two small actions that you can take to overcome your burnout. Now, these are your actions. This is not what works for a friend of yours or somebody who you admire. This is what works for you. And so being really intentional and really detailed about those actions um, and then holding yourself accountable for doing them. And then that last piece is uh, one way that you'll make an intentional connection. So you heard me say, when we make intentional connections, it help us kick, kick burnout to the curb. So what's going to be your sort of intentional connection that you can make when you're experiencing burnout to help you overcome it? 
And so some examples can be, you know, um, maybe you'll talk with your supervisor about how to clear up the certain or the uncertainty around your role a little bit more. Um, and then I also put a second piece, I will connect with a friend for coffee. So you see, I've got kind of a connection at work and a connection outside of work. Um, I chose to sort of write it out that way. Of course, whatever works for you um, is going to be more powerful here. And once you've accomplished those first two pages, now you've got a lot of information about your burnout, what it looks like, the things that you might do to overcome it. And then we're going to dive into how you are going to prevent your burnout long term. This is where you really want to think about your risk factors and writing them out. Um, because what you're thinking about there is what happens in my life? What are some of the things that happen in my life that then lead me to be burned out? And for many of us, that there can be patterns. There can be some things that we see there um, that, that can help us sort of be on high alert about our own feelings. And then uh, I want you to really think about some two self-care strategies that work for you and that you can realistically implement now, okay? So the key word there is realistically. I think, you know, we all love that self-care strategy that places us in the spa all day long, but that's not always realistic. So thinking about something that you can do regardless of the circumstances. And then in the last two sections, you'll write one boundary that you need to set to sort of help you prevent burnout. Um, and my example there was, I need to say no to non-job related duties for the next two months until I find balance. And you'll see I really made it detailed there for the next two months um, because that's something that it, it, gives, it gives you sort of a check back point, right? In two months, I'm going to reassess and see where I am. And then finally, you'll want to dive into your why. So you're gonna close out this action plan by writing out your why. And so my goal for this action plan for you is once it's complete, um, something it should be something that you revisit, right? So you'll complete the action plan. Um, I encourage you to find a, either a motivation or an accountability partner, maybe someone who took this course and who has the action plan, um, or maybe you share the action plan with someone, but find somebody to work through this with you. Um, it's always helpful to have somebody kind of holding you accountable for things that you, you wanna do to make your life better. And then in general, doing regular assessments, regular check-ins with yourself, constantly asking yourself, do I need to go back and modify the action plan? Do I need to change my self-care strategy? Do I need to modify my boundary because maybe it's not working? Um, and so really regularly checking in there. And then earlier today, if you rated high on that burnout scale, so if you rated high on those questions, um, and so that would be answering uh, more than half of them as yes, please take one small action today, whatever that looks like. We've got crazy weather here in NC, so I don't think you will uh, go for a walk, but maybe there's something else that you can do to just take one small action today. And then of course, continue to stay intentional, sign up for additional programs, um, surround yourself with information about wellness and intentionality with ourselves. And HRI is a great resource to do that. And so we've got a couple of upcoming programs that you might be interested in joining. Um, so I encourage you to stay connected with us. Uh, all of our programs right now are free and we're diving into a number of different topics. We're actually launching our holiday series starting next week. Uh, the first program will be coping with loneliness. And the second program is making tough choices and setting boundaries around the holidays. So if these topics sound interesting to you, we encourage you to please sign up for them. Um, and of course, just remember that the number one thing you can do to sort of prevent burnout and to overcome it is to take a step, right? To take one step in that direction, whatever that looks like for you. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody again for being with me here today. I'm so glad we didn't have any uh, Wi-Fi connectivity issues. We really lucked out there. I am going to send you a feedback form in the link. Uh, it would be really helpful for me if you just completed that. Just a, a few short questions to let me know how I did today and whether this content was helpful to you. Um, I'd like to just say another thank you to Healthy UNCG and Steph for um, always just being such a great partner and, and uh, always working with us, and we really appreciate that. Um, for those of you who are with us on Zoom, uh, you will receive the slides and the action plan as well as some additional resources via email later today. And for those of you who are with us on Facebook, we'll send you some links so that you can get the slides and the action plan. Um, and if you're interested in, in seeking out some additional resources, 
feel free to send us a direct message and we'll connect you with those resources as well. So thank you everyone for sticking with me today. Uh, I hope that everyone has a wonderful and restful rest of the week. And remember, take one small step towards overcoming your burnout today. Thanks everyone, take care.